where we find ourselves returning once again to the book of Genesis. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. We're going to do things to following the similar order that we followed last week. We're not going to uh, read a specific portion of scripture because of the length of the text. And so as we work our way through it, we'll light upon certain verses. So I hope that's acceptable to you. A little different from the pattern that we follow, but that's what we'll do once again today. So let's bow our heads together for prayer. Heavenly Father, we have assembled here today in this place, and we have, through our worship and song and prayer and celebration of communion, rejoiced in the life that we have in Christ, that we are united in and with him. And Heavenly Father, we pray now that as we come to consider your word together, that your hand would rest upon these moments that follow. Heavenly Father, each person assembled here coming from different contexts, we pray once again that you, through your word read and spoken, would touch hearts and encourage hearts today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that your hand would rest upon me. May the joy of this message uh, permeate the words that I speak today. I stand before you as one in desperate need for your spirit, seeing no good thing in myself, but seeing that my salvation and my sufficiency is in Christ. And so we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. This, of course, as we've said before, is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. And so I don't feel too badly that after five messages or so, we are finally breaking our way out of Genesis. As a matter of fact, as I was uh, coming down the road today, uh, I started thinking about the length of time that it has taken for us to get just to the very point we are now in the book itself. And I realized that if I spoke every Sunday and I labored at the pace that I continued to labor with, there might be a pastor depreciation Sunday that might be extended towards it. Because there's a, a length of time that exists between uh, the times I come here to share from this text. Uh, as far as I know, it hasn't been too laborsome for you, and I hope that nevertheless it has been uh, beneficial. I must say that as I have gone through this text, studying Genesis, uh, now working through it for the second time, uh, going verse by verse, I have learned a great deal, and it's been very beneficial to me uh, personally. Well, we have come to this text, and we have said that this chapter is divided into four parts, and I will restate them for you once again. That the first part, or the first scene, if this were a four-act play, would be verses 1 through 9. And it is there that Abraham calls his servant to himself, and Abraham commissions him with a task of going to the land of Nahor so that he might secure a bride for his son Isaac. Isaac at this time is about 40 years of age, 38, 40 years of age. And so uh, he commissions his servant on this task to secure a bride, a wife for Isaac. In verses uh, 16, or rather 10 through 32, we have the servant leaving uh, Abraham and arriving at this well outside the city of Nahor, and it is there that he meets Rebekah. In verses 33 through 60, we have the servant of the Lord at the home of Laban. And then finally, verses 61 through 67, we have uh, the servant and Rebekah returning uh, to the area uh, near Negeb. So last week, as we were gathered together, we were considering verse 33. Here, uh, the servant is sitting at the dinner table of Laban and uh, Laban's father, Bethuel. The family is gathered together. He has already met Rebekah at the well, and he believes that as a result of the prayer that he offered and the answer that he received of the Lord concerning his prayer, that Rebekah is the person that he will take back to be joined in marriage to Isaac. 
after he has had a brief interaction with her, he, upon this belief that she's the one, requests for the opportunity to spend the night with them. And she tells him that they have plenty of food, plenty of accommodations, please come. Now he has given gifts to Rebecca that are a result of the service that she has rendered to him. Rebecca goes on ahead of Abraham, or rather goes ahead uh, of uh, Abraham going to her house and tells her brother Laban that she has received these gifts and she has heard of this individual Abraham, an individual probably she had heard about uh, many times in the past, uh, kind of a great uncle we might call him. And Laban, hearing about this and seeing the gifts that have been given to Rebekah, he runs to meet Abraham and he invites him to come to their home to eat. As they arrive at the home, dinner has already been made. Uh, the servant takes care of his animals, his camels and what have you, and he goes to sit down at a table to partake of food together with this family. And so they're ready to eat the food. Everything smells good. You can just imagine them sitting around this table at this point in time. And the, the, the invitation is, come, eat. And the servant says, I will not eat until I discharge my purpose for being here. I must declare to you a message. There was an urgency that he felt. This urgency that he felt uh, superseded the fact that he was probably greatly hungry from the long journey that he had uh, undertaken and probably still thirsty. So he, was, he had these, these physical needs, but this, this necessity to discharge uh, his duty overtook all of those things. And we referred to Jesus and how when he, uh, when he was talking to the woman at the well, he spoke to his disciples and he said, that there was a calling that he had upon his life that superseded the hunger that he was experiencing at that particular point in time. We also looked at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul looked at his life as one who was driven to discharge the duty of declaring the gospel to the Gentiles that God had given him. And consequently, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. He diligently pursued with urgency what God had called him to do. And so here the servant is, and he is saying, I must discharge this message to you. And so Laban says, go ahead and speak. And so now we begin in verse 34, and we begin to see what it is that he had to say. He said, I am Abraham's servant. He identifies himself specifically to, a to Laban, and he announces himself officially to everyone, even to Rebekah herself, who had heard him say that he was connected with Abraham earlier on at their meeting at the well. And then he goes on and he says in verse 35, the Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, male servants, female servants, camels and donkeys. Now, there's a very significant thing that is happening here and we're going to work our way through the kind of the surface meaning of the words that are uh, given to us here, and then go back and work our way through again uh, in, in, a, in a more deeper way in the significance behind these events. But the surface meaning of what he's saying is, I'm Abraham's servant, and Abraham, who left many years ago, he's been off in this land of Canaan, and God has greatly blessed him. When Abraham left the area, he had plenty of possessions. He had servants accompanying him as they were on their way. He was not an individual that struggled for a means of living. But as he has gone to this land, God has continued to bless him. He's added servants to him. He's ha added uh, livestock to him. He's become a very wealthy person in this place. Now, why would that have been significant for him to say? Well, it was probably significant for him to say because the servant knows what he is going to request. He is going to request of Laban, I want to take your sister back with me so that she might be the bride to Isaac. It's significant because he doesn't show up in tattered clothes. <laughs> he doesn't show up 
as appearing of one who has no means, and his master has no means, to request for them to release Rebecca to go with him. Does that make sense? Yes, we would, we would be just so happy to take Rebecca and surrender her to you so that she can go and live a life of poverty. Now, he tells them that Abraham has means. And he knows that as he begins to unfold this story and he requests that she come with them, that they are not surrendering her to a situation that will uh, present desperate situation for her. Does that make sense? There's a very practical reason as to why he says this. And then he goes on to say that Sarah, Sarah, his wife, when she was old, gave birth to a son. Now that's significant that he declares that to them because he's going to ask once again Rebecca to go with him, right? And he's going to request this so that she might marry Isaac. Of course, the issue is how old is Isaac? Well, if we do the math and we realize what's transpiring here, we realize that Sarah was very old when she gave birth to Isaac and it was miraculous. Rebecca is Abraham's nephew's daughter. So that would place them basically at the same age level, right? So that I'm not saying anything about, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about separation of years and marriage, but he's, he's saying I'm not taking her back so that she's going to be joined in marriage to someone who has their foot almost in the grave. You see what I'm saying? He's, she's going to be going back and she's going to be joined to someone who is basically her age. And so then, and, and, and I'm sure that in the context of, of declaring this, this whole idea of how miraculous it was that this son was born came through loud and clear to Laban and Bethuel and the rest of the family. And then he says, this task that I am undertaking is something that is extremely serious. I even had to swear an oath that I would discharge exactly after the manner my master gave me the duty that was given to me. And I have come to find a wife here, not from the Canaanites. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But then he presses, he goes on and says, he, let's paraphrase now, the only way that I could be successful in this mission is if God went before me in the securing of this wife. And he recounts to them as to how the angel of the Lord was to go before him and lead him. And then he recounts how it is that he arrived. He didn't know how to go about fulfilling this task. There's no manual in hand that could tell him how to find a bride for your master's son that he could follow. And he's praying. He's asking God to lead him. And God leads him in his prayer and answers his prayer after such a manner that when Rebecca arrives, as we've seen last week and before, it appears and it seems that she is the answer to his prayers. Now, after he has gone through all of this explanation, he says, basically, I believe that Rebecca is the one to come back with me and to be the bride of Isaac. Will you let her go? Now let's look what is underneath the surface of this that could be perhaps not seen. When he begins to speak about Abraham and how Abraham has gone to this land and God has made him wealthy there, the thing that they would have realized is that Abraham had left everything that he had back in Ur, and he had gone to another place. And perhaps they knew something 
about why it was that he went. But as this servant is speaking to them, he begins to make very clearly clear with the information we're given here, what was happening in the life of Abraham. They would have known because they were of the line of Shem, that they were the godly line, that there were promises that had come many years before. Those promises that had come to them had come to Adam and Eve. For after Adam and Eve fell into sin, there are certain consequences that God announces to them that will come as a result of their sin. But with those consequences also comes a promise. A promise given to Eve that there is going to come one after you, your seed. And he will crush the head of the serpent and his heel will be bruised. A promise of a Messiah coming. And so consequently, they would have known that from the day of Adam and Eve until their very existence, that there was one who was going to come. There was a Messiah coming. And when he talks about Abraham and being uprooted and taken to this place, he is, and I would suggest to you as, as a parenthetical phrase here at this point, that he would have given further explanation to what it was that he was saying. He's not, we don't have a full uh, rendition of the words that he actually said. But he would have talked to them about how Abraham had been called out of Ur. Why did he leave? Why did he leave those people there? Why did he leave his kindred? Why did he leave everything behind and go to this place? He was called out of that place because God had called him to himself, had caused him to be born again, and he was taking him out of the land that he was living in into another land altogether. He was separating him. And this separation was Abraham then carrying on the promise that had been given to Eve now being continued to him in him. Does that make sense? Abraham in the line of Shem. God has called him and God has worked mightily on his behalf as he has been in this location. And now the promise being perpetuated through him has resulted in the birth of Isaac. Now the seed will come initially through Abraham, now through Isaac, but there is a problem. There's a problem because there is no one to whom he is joined in marriage. And he must have a wife. Now this, this whole idea of, of talking about not getting a wife among the Canaanites, you, you can almost think initially when he may have said that, that they may have thought, well, why have you come all the way over here? Well, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of beautiful and nice women back in Canaan. But... The idea is that he must be joined with the house of Shem. And that is why he has come there. And that is why he is going to ask them and does ask them for Rebekah to be joined uh, to Isaac in marriage. And so what we basically have here, and, and, and I, I kind of wondered as I was thinking about this, knowing that you, you know, the scriptures are given to us, and not everything about every situation is written in the Word of God, right? But w what we have is given to us so we might have an understanding of the truth. But I was wondering, as this servant was talking to Laban and Bethuel, the household, if he said, yes, I can, I can remember the time. Uh, Abraham told me about this when he was concerned about whether or not he would have a son. And he was crying out to God, and in Genesis 15, God came and he spoke to him. And he said, Abraham, come out, out of your tent and look up into the skies and tell me what you see. And he went there and he saw the stars filling the sky, and God said, so shall the number of your descendants be. The gospel going to go forth, but it will come through a seed, it will come through one well, I believe that what we have here basically is the anticipation of a Messiah coming. That message 
is the message that the servant proclaimed to the household. Does that make sense? That here we have a, a brief encapsulation of the gospel, the Old Testament version of Messiah coming, one who would give himself for the sins of those that he would redeem, a Messiah, a Savior. And he comes to this point with them, and he says, do you believe? Will you let her go? We look here in verses 50 and 51. After he's, after he's uh, um, let me read verse 49. After he's told the story, he says, now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. We'll, we'll get to the response in a second, because I don't want to miss this. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thing that he does here. He is depending upon God and his grace to bring to pass the answer of his request. He had talked to Abraham, and Abraham, he, he was concerned. What if I go there and they won't, let her, they won't release her to me? What will I do then? And he says, if that happens, then you are released from your oath as would be carried out there. Now you would think that the seriousness of this situation would result in the fact that this servant would have taken some time to cajole them. To say, listen, I really believe that this is the right thing to happen. I really believe that she is to be the wife of Isaac and press upon them the need for them to respond to what it is he's asking them to do. But he doesn't do that, does he? He just says, listen, do you believe this or not? Because if, if, you, if you believe it, great, we're on our way. But if you don't believe it, then I'm gone. <laughs> now, what does that remind you of? Well, that reminds me of some words that Jesus spoke a couple of times to those that followed him. He sent out the 12 in Matthew 10. He sent out the 72 in Luke. I forget the chapter because I'm away from my notes. And he said, when you go, if you go to a house and they welcome you, eat of their food, stay with them as long as you're there, and don't go anywhere else. But if you go into a town, what are you to do? You are to shake the dust off your feet. We say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this, we can't do it quite like that, you know. We need to stay here a little bit longer. Everybody's rejected us, but we're going to continue to stay. Well, I'm not going to get into individual situations that might reflect that somewhat, but you notice what Jesus was saying here is that when you go and you announce the truth, you are dependent upon the grace of God to work and to act. And if that grace does not act, not as a result of your somehow trying to make someone believe or respond, when the grace of God, if it does not act, you are to go on to the next place. Does that make sense? And this basically is what is transpiring here in this text. He's saying, listen, if you're not going to release her, I'm gone. Because the grace of God hasn't worked. But if you respond properly, then we see that God has acted here today. And what's the response? What's the response? Here it says, Laban and Bethuel. Here we... Bethuel, he's been missing. You know, all of a sudden, here he is. I don't know. He's just arrives, you know, whatever. But here he is in the text. And they say, this thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you, bad or good. We're, <laughs> they're, li they're like just speechless at this point. Now, now think about what it is that he's saying. You are going to release Rebecca to go with a guy. We don't even know who he is. He says he's from Abraham, but I don't know. <laughs> They're going to let her go. And they say, this thing is from the Lord. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son. As the Lord has spoken, God had spoken to their hearts. This 
was a miraculous thing. This took place. It, 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 it didn't take place. The servant says, listen, I know, I know this is kind of new to you. And you may need to take some time to get used to what it is that I'm proposing to you and think it through and so forth. No, this happens, this happens like almost instantaneously, doesn't it? And the only way that that would happen and the type of response that came would have been if, grace, if the grace of God had worked in the midst of the situation, convincing. Well, we go on then in the text and we see that uh, they say this is good. She can go with you. And so Abraham gives, uh, the master rather, gives uh, to Rebekah uh, treasures because she is going to go back with him. Now everything seems to be settled, doesn't it? This, you, you know, you can almost get the sense, the, service, the servant, he, after he was, okay, we eat, you know, and he's given the gifts, and it's, he's ready to go to bed and sleep, get a good night's rest, and he lays his head to the pillow, and he's uh, rejoicing in God, because when they said she could go, he rejoiced in the text it tells us, and he's just grateful, and can you imagine the burden that must have been lifted off of his chest that night when he laid his head to the pillow? But the next morning came. The next morning came, and he got up, and he was ready to leave. And as he was ready to leave, Laban says, Listen, why don't you let her stay for another ten days? Just ten days, so we can spend a little bit more time with her. And the servant says, I'm out of here. I'm leaving if you do not allow her to go with me, I am gone. And they say, well, let's get Rebecca and let's ask her what she feels about this whole thing. That would, wouldn't, if you were a young lady in the situation, would you like to have some input into the situation? And they ask her to come. And they ask her, Rebecca, will you go with this servant? And she says an astounding thing. She says, I will go. Now think about her situation and what she must have been feeling. She is now being called to leave her place of comfort, her place of provision, her place of family relationships and friends. And she is going to go with this person that she does not know. How would you feel? I will go. She responded that way because God had worked in her heart. And I believe that what God did in her heart was synonymous with how it is that we come to faith in Christ. Because it was a result of God's grace sovereignly working upon her heart. There's no other reason. There's no other reason that we can find as to why she would have responded after that manner. But if we think about it, we realize someone else responded the same way in the context of them having faith. Why, it was Abraham himself. When God came to him, and he was living in the midst of a people who did not believe, and God called him effectually to himself, and Abraham, at the call of God, left everything behind. How so? Because his life and his heart had been touched. He had been transformed. He had been changed. His perspective was completely different than what it had been before. He had become alive. And Rebecca in saying, I will go, reveals to us the life of one who was born again, <laughs> like Abraham had been. And the scriptures tell us that, of course, they then go on their way, and they arrive back in the land of the Negev, where Isaac is. Now let's, let's consider just briefly what has transpired? Because there are like three things here that I want to emphasize. 
that I think are revealed in the text concerning our salvation. The first thing that we see in the text about Rebecca specifically is that she was appointed. She was appointed for this task. She was elected for this task. Out of all the other people that were there that could have been prospects, she alone was the one that God had appointed. And we see that the servant is praying after this manner in verse 14 of Genesis 24. When he's asking for the, guard, the guidance of the Lord, he says, please let, he says to the woman, I say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you, what? You have appointed for your servant, Isaac. Now there's a whole issue of how it is that we come to faith in Christ, right? Most of us have been raised in a context where the manner in which we uh, come to Christ, many, uh, many probably, and many here perhaps, were sitting in a context where a sermon, something was transpiring, and at the end of a message, individuals were invited to come forward. Is that not true? Individuals oftentimes have responded to what we call as altar calls. And the, the idea or the way to come into the kingdom is that an individual responds after this manner, and after responding after that manner, then they are saved, right? They they, uh, they've responded to come forward, they have prayed a prayer, and now they're saved. You know, I, I, Billy, Billy Graham, uh, for years, decades, proclaimed this message. And it was a message, really, that became popular in the mid-1800s. Prior to that time, there were no altar calls that were given. Can you imagine? I don't know how people were saved. Was, it was only by the grace of God that they could have been saved. No altar calls. I remember when I was talking to my mom one time, I was in college, and I, I just was curious about my mom. My mom had, was, was a Christian, and my dad had drifted from the faith for, um, for, for a number of years uh, during my youth, coming back to the Lord later on in life. But my mother was just very diligent in, in leading us in devotions and praying for us and it was a very godly example for me. And I was shocked one day. Because one day, I said, Mom, would you tell me what happened when you became a believer? And do you know what she said to me? She said, Roger, I, I, I don't think I can tell you specifically. And I thought, you mean you didn't go forward at a meeting and all of a sudden everything that mom had been to me was now in question you know she did not go forward and I, I remember just being concerned mom god you know mom didn't go forward in a meeting and i don't is she saved i don't know <laughs> well interestingly interestingly enough we see people somehow came to christ and let me say that that later on i realized in my life I didn't go forward either. So I was in the same shoes she was in. <laughs> I was just in a context, and I believed, you know. We discover, that we discover in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, Peter's giving this message, and at the end of the message he said, now I want every head bowed and every eye closed, and those of you that want to believe, please come forward to me, and, and we the disciples, we're here to receive you. As a matter of fact, there are more than just 12, because this is Pentecost, we need more people. And so, to pray with you. And so, but that's not what happened, is it? He was speaking, and God didn't even let him finish his message. In the midst of his message, they cry out and they say, what must we do to be saved? Why did they say that? Well, the word of God tells us that the unspiritual man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. How did they, as unspiritual men, receive the things of the Spirit to respond to the grace of God? I tell you that when they cried out, how can we be saved, God had touched their hearts. And that's why they could receive what was, that what was being declared to them. Christ became 
their Savior. And we see the Philippian jailer the, say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overlap some things here. But we see the same thing true with the Philippian jailer, don't we? Where he, the, the doors of the jail have been opened. And he's the guard and he's fearful that all the prisoners have escaped and he's about to take his life. And Paul after, and Silas after having been beaten half to death say, stop. We're all here. And so Paul began to articulate for him a very cogent and persuasive message of the gospel, right? No. He just says, what can I do to be saved? (laughs) Because God's grace descended upon him. And he believed. The grace of God comes upon us and descends upon us and we, and it comes to those who are of the elect. Those that God is calling out. Appointed. In Jeremiah, the first chapter, kind of, and, I, and now I'm realizing I have more text than I can refer to, so I'll try to be succinct. In Jeremiah 1, verse 5, These words are recorded. Now the word of the Lord came to me, says Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Notice here that the scriptures say that even before he was born, God had called him. And that call was going to be effectuated in his life in his daily existence, at some point in time. He had been appointed, and he had been called out, separated. It says consecrated, which means separated from others. I have separated you from others. I have called you myself to a specific task, that you might be my prophet, my mouthpiece. Well, this sounds like Paul. Where Paul says in Galatians 1.15, God set me apart before I was born. Here is the man who persecuted Christians. Here is a man who railed against the gospel. And here is a man who is saying, before I was born, God set me apart and called me by his grace to be a preacher, a proclaimer to the Gentiles. We see the same same thing happening in Romans, the 8th chapter. In Romans, the 8th chapter. If I can find it here. Talk amongst yourselves as I... (laughs) Romans chapter 8. He says, and we know that those who love God, all things work together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that they might be the first born among many brethren. There's so many things here we can't go into all, all of that. And those he predestined, he called. You notice here in this text, At the very beginning, before he begins to talk about uh, this whole issue of things and benefits of salvation, he says, we're called according to his purpose. That's you and me. Jeremiah was called with a purpose. And Paul was called with a purpose. And that call or that appointment, that setting apart took place in the context of eternity. And in the context of eternity, what was true of Jeremiah and what was true of Paul is also true of you. That God, in the context of eternity, set you apart. He separated you. He separated you from the world does not believe. And he separated you for a purpose. And you are living that purpose right now. The purpose for which he has called you. The scriptures tell us that in Ephesians, what the second chapter, we have been appointed unto good works that we walk in that God has prepared for us. 
We can't change what it is that God has planned for us. I was talking to someone who, who said uh, towards the end of Billy Graham's ministry, someone's going to rise up and take his place. And he thought, well, it could be me. It could be me if I surrender myself to the Lord and if I am faithful and so forth. Perhaps I could be that person or maybe perhaps someone else could be that person. We are who we are in Christ because he called us with a purpose and he separated us to live our lives living out that purpose. And some of the times those circumstances in which we live can be extremely trying. Sometimes we wish that they were different than what they were. But we know this to be sure. That wherever it is that we find ourselves, God has called us and he's put us in that place to do something in us, to be conformed to the image of his son and to carry out his purposes through us. That makes us, I mean, I almost hate to say this, special, you know. Is that encouraging? I guess probably maybe it's just self-evident. But there's something else. There's something else here in this text that is significant in relationship to our calling. And it's revealed to us in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now we could look at this and we could really focus on the fact that we have been chosen before the foundation of the world because we've been talking about being chosen before, you know, we were in our mother's womb, right? But there's there's this phrase there. There's, There's two words that come to us in this, that we could just gloss right over. He says, you have been chosen, what? In him. You've been chosen in him. What does that phrase mean? Well, when we look at that phrase in the scriptures, we see that over and over again, in him refers to being united with him. The Apostle Paul, one who persecuted Christians, realized that he had been chosen in Christ in eternity. That there was a pre-existent connection or unity with Christ that he had in eternity. Now, of course, he had to be born. And he had to go through the process that he went through because before the union took place in its fulfillment, he was an enemy of the cross. He himself. He was an enemy to Christ. He was one who was unclean. He was wicked. He was a separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But the point in time came in his life where the grace of God broke upon his life and his life was transformed, he was changed. And that union that was established in eternity became a union in reality. Does that make sense? And you see the neat thing about being united to Christ is that if we are united to Christ and we are in Christ, then that means that everything that he possesses becomes ours. And you notice here it says, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What blessings do we need I need to experience the effectual call. I I need that purpose. I need faith. I need regeneration. I need justification. I need sanctification. I need glorification. Did Christ experience all of these things? And he did. And because he fulfilled the Father's will. And his verification came in his resurrection. All 
all of those things become ours. It's like, it's like a package that comes to us, I think. It's a package that comes to us and it's given to us in Christ. Everything we need. And that means that it is everything that we need, not just at, at our inception of faith, and then we don't know what about the future. It means that those things are ours now. It's been given to us. It's been presented to us. Now, there's some texts I don't have time to go through uh, today to establish you know, that fact. But it's this whole idea of union with Christ that is so critical. And I'm going to leave us today at this, with, with this thought. That when... Earlier on in our lives, we heard about salvation. We would hear individuals say, you need to receive Christ. Receive Christ. You know, it's interesting that that appears so infrequently in the scriptures. I can think of one place where it does in the Gospel of John. But what appears over and over is being in Christ. You see, the calling that is fulfilled is not so much that we received him, we receive him, but that we need to be in him. In him. We are in him. We are united with him through faith, through regeneration, through the operations of all of the elements that come to us in the context of blessings and this rich salvation. Does this make sense? Calvin said, we need to get people into Christ, into him. Call them into him because it is there that we find our fountainhead of blessings that we have. So you, you have a calling on your life that is unique to you, which I know you know is true. And you are in Christ, in Christ, to enjoy, to be the benefactor of all of the heavenly blessings that God has to offer through him. Today we celebrate Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And I was thinking about this specific message. This is the gospel that pastors proclaim and this is the gospel that believers announce. And uh, I'm thankful, thankful for you as a fellowship, uh, thankful for my relationship with uh, John that I've had through many years. Thankful for the gospel messages that changes and transforms and unites us to Christ. This is our hope. Heavenly Father, I pray that in these words that have been spoken today that there has been some encouragement to those that are here. And I pray, pray Father, that even in the inadequacy of who I am and the words I speak, I pray that you have been glorified today. We declare to you, Father, our love for you, our thankfulness for you, for the life that we have in you. We pray this and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.